Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mitch Daniels, President, Purdue University. Greetings, everyone. I am Mitch Daniels, President of Purdue University, welcoming you to the inaugural program of our new Center for Tech Diplomacy, built to examine that rapidly growing list of topics at the intersection of modern technology and foreign policy. The Center will seek to answer fundamental emerging questions. Will our technologies protect and promote freedom or enable tyrannies more comprehensive and oppressive than any history has known? Will those technologies so disrupt and discredit democratic institutions that the world's nations turn to authoritarianism to maintain order and pursue societal progress? How might pro-freedom outcomes be made more likely? As they are at the heart of our wired world itself, semiconductors, the security of their design and the reliability of their supply are at the heart of many issues in this new field of inquiry. And we have with us today two of the nation's most influential figures on that topic. Keith Kroc, a former Purdue board chairman, is a serial entrepreneur and recently an undersecretary of state. Pat Gelsinger is the CEO of Intel, a dynamic leader to whom his company and the nation are looking to revitalize chip manufacturing in this country. So from here in West Lafayette, Indiana, I turn the program over to its two hosts, on the two coasts, Keith in New York and Pat in Silicon Valley. <laughs> well, Mitch, thanks for that uh, introduction. You know, I just want everybody to, uh, you don't know about Mitch Daniels. Wall Street Journal calls him the most innovative university president in the United States. Uh, and it started off uh, when he came on board, and the first thing we did is we froze tuition, and it's been 10 years in counting to really attack that student debt uh, issue. He also, uh, well, the next thing that we did is we formed uh, Purdue University Global, which is a national treasure for retraining the workforce. And then, of course, yesterday we announced uh, the Center for Technology Diplomacy to advance freedom. And today, uh, Purdue has announced, you can check it out on uh, purdue.edu. Pat, you're going to love this, is a master's degree in semiconductors. So this is for design as well as manufacturing. And uh, we also have minors in semiconductor uh, engineering uh, at Purdue at, a, at an undergraduate level. And so, you know, Pat, with that, you know, one of the first questions, we've worked a long time together. so. It's great to uh, see you, um, even if it's on the two coasts. You know, tell everybody a little bit about the talent and the human capital required in the semiconductor business, because it's really unique from every other industry. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And, you know, first, thank you for the warm introduction and pleasure to be here with my Boilermaker friends. You know, I'm not a Boilermaker, I'm a Cardinal out here at Stanford, but my first boss at Intel was a uh, Purdue graduate. So he indoctrinated me pretty thoroughly into all the great things there in, in uh, Lafayette. So great to join uh, uh, today and the great president and uh, all the wonderful things that Purdue is doing. You know, we think about the semiconductor uh, industry and if I view Intel, uh, you know, I'm 115,000 employees and over 70% of them carry a technical degree of some sort. And uh, everything from, you know, entry level uh, technicians, how I began at the company, all the way up through the most advanced uh, PhD work in material science and physics and chemistry. And, you know, pretty much everything in between architects, software engineers, uh, AI, and uh, data uh, analytics uh, work. Uh, the most uh, you know cutting edge work around uh, distributed systems, cloud, you know, and all of those come together in delivering a semiconductor today. And you know we <laughs> we deeply rely on a talent uh, pipeline. And Purdue's been one of our great source universities over a long period of time. And I was thrilled to hear about the uh, new degrees, uh, specifically in semiconductors, because as you might have heard. Right, Keith, we're planning on building a whole lot more here in uh, the USA, and I'm going to need a lot of talent to do that. Well, Pat, uh, I'm glad to hear that 
The big <laughs> boilermakers make great uh, semiconductor engineers, and, and I appreciate that. I know uh, a lot of Purdue people uh, work, at, work at Intel. And picking up on what you uh, just last said, uh, um, you know, uh, and we talked about this yesterday. Uh, when I was under Secretary of uh, State, uh, we were able to lead the largest onshoring in history. Uh, that now has resulted in $350 billion uh, of investment and jobs in the United States. And Intel makes up the big, a big, big part of that. And right when you came on board at Intel, you announced a $20 billion uh, investment in your Chandler facility, and now a uh, big one. Please tell everybody about that, Pat, and, and what you're doing, because you've just really amped it up. <laughs> well, you know, what we said, and as I came back, uh, you know, right, coming into a job like this, uh, you know, an icon like Intel, and hey, we stumbled, and boy, you know, putting that back where Intel needs to be is the right thing for the legacy of the company, the industry, but most importantly, the nation uh, as well. So we announced what we called our IDM 2.0 strategy, you know, that we're going to double down and being a manufacturer for our products, but we're going to open our foundries up for the industry, something Intel had never really done before at scale. And to put an exclamation point on that, uh, we announced our Arizona expansion. In fact, I'm down there Friday, we're having the groundbreaking, as I say, you know, we, it's easy to talk about these things, but when shovels hit dirt, okay, now we're getting serious. So we're opening the, uh, you know, the two new fabs. We also announced an expansion in New Mexico uh, as well, and that's underway. We have expansions underway already in our Oregon facility. But the big thing we said is we're going to start our next Greenfield site as well. Uh, and I hope to get that announced this year and, uh, you know, our next state, our next major location. And that would be a monster, what I've called a mega fab location, because we want it to be not big enough for one, not two, but up to eight fabs each fab at $10 billion. This is an extraordinary build out of uh, capacity on US soil. And obviously some of your work uh, uh, when you were uh, you know, for uh, the undersecretary was very much uh, you know, building up the political capacity for that from the US as well. And now we have the CHIPS Act is now in the house as something that we're anxious to get that approved so we can be then announcing this expansion at our next major greenfield location in the U.S., the largest capital build out in our nation's history in the area of semiconductors. Yeah. So, Pat, I'm going to come back to the CHIPS Act, but, you know, I think one thing that our audience would really like to get your perspective on, and uh, I talked about it uh, yesterday in my keynote, was the issue of trust in the semiconductor uh, supply chain. You know, and, and you were on the DocuSign Advisory Board um, you help us build out the DocuSign uh, Global Trust Network. And, you know, we always used to say at DocuSign, we're not in the software business, we're in the trust business. And, um, and it's critical in these supply chains. So tell us a little, why is it important that we build uh, our fabs in the United States and, and, and the role trust plays? Yeah, yeah, and let me, you know, let, let's first click up just a little bit, uh, uh, Keith, and, you know, you know, you and I, we have a little bit of like the mutual admiration society going on between us, so our, you know, apologize to our audience for that, but, uh, you, know, you know, as we think about every aspect of human society, it's becoming more digital, and, you know, what is powering everything digital? You know, you know, I've called it the superpowers of cloud and infrastructure and connectivity and AI. Everything is semiconductors. This is the most important thing for our economic as well as our national security looking forward. I've sort of quipped that uh, God decided where the oil reserves are. We can decide where the fabs are. And for that, you know, as we think about this most critical thing, and we're coming off of COVID where our supply chains were disrupted. You know, we're finding that uh, PPE, vaccines, certain things are only available at a few spots in the world. Wow, you know, that is extraordinarily, right, you know, precarious for our national security and our economic interests. We get to decide where the fabs are and everything is going more digital. And we said, boy, we need to create a more resilient and globally balanced supply chain 
because we want to know where the IP is coming from, where the manufacturing package assembly, you know, the uh, core designs are coming from, because that is our economic uh, future. So I want to, I want the U.S. to be able to say, "There's my fab, there's my packaging, there's my, you know, system assembly, there's my software, and all of those are from our trusted supply chain." You know, some of the work that you did on the clean initiative was reinforcing how critical that is, both for economic as well as security reasons for this great nation that we're part of. Yeah, well, thank you for that. And by the way, also thank you, Pat. When we were, uh, uh, you know, I was at the State Department, we were building uh, the, the Clean Network Alliance of Democracies comprised of countries and, and companies and civil society that operate by the set of uh, trust values. You were one of the first clean companies <laughs> to come on board and you talked about 5G so I'm, I'm deeply grateful for that. And you talked about the importance of security and, and trust in the 5G networks, just like those um, supply chains. And you know, the, the key to it was harnessing US's three biggest areas of competitive advantage by rallying our allies, our friends, leveraging the innovation resource of the private sector and amplifying the moral high ground of democratic values. You think this can be applied uh, to, you know, other semiconductors as well as all the other industries because, you know, VMware, you were involved with so many of those. Yeah, and I really do. And if we, you know, you know let, let's, just, let's just zoom back three, four years in time, uh, Keith, and you recall how desperately concerned we were about, uh, you know, the influence of Huawei and 5G and what that's going to look like. And as we fast forward today, we've built an open RAN, virtualized RAN environment, you know, that allows us largely with US and European technology to build 5G networks. And with companies like Intel, Qualcomm, and a few others, you know, we're leading the journey, you know, to 6G as well. So we sort of say, we did it, right? You know, as you say, you know, the innovation focused on cloud software, silicon core capabilities of American companies, we did it. Here we are now with semiconductors, and over the last 30 years, what we've seen is Europe has declined from 44 to 9%. U.S. has declined from 37 to 12% of global semiconductor supply. And we've suggested a moonshot that 10 years from now, and with efforts like the CHIPS Act, and the EU has recently announced their equivalent of the CHIPS Act, and you know, we believe that we can go to 12 to 30 percent in the U.S. and Europe has set a goal of going from nine to 20 percent. And if we were here a decade from now and we're at 50-50 U.S., Europe and uh, Asia, we'd all be feeling like, boy, we are on a path that gives us that globally resilient, leading technology and geographically balanced supply chain for the future. I am absolutely convinced that we can accomplish this and we're feeling good support from the industry as well as from you know bicameral, as well as uh, you know bipartisan support as well. So hopefully all of these things come together. You know that's a big part of the reason I took this job, and we're well underway. Right, and and and, and you know your point is is uh, is a good one. I mean, at the beginning of 2020, it was a desperate situation in 5G. <laughs> it, it also was a desperate situation bringing semiconductor manufacturing back, and with that clean network alliance of democracy provided unity and continuity of policy between a Republican administration and a Democrat administration, which is so key uh, in terms of our allies, and it actually strikes fear in General Secretary uh, Xi uh, over there in China. You know, when, when, when that biggest on China in history happened, one of the theories we had was that um, we could, it could be a catalyst for congressional funding. And as you know, and you've talked about it, we've helped design uh, the, the CHIPS Act, and that also got combined with another bill that we designed with Senator Schumer and Senator Young called the Endless Frontier Act, which was $150 billion of research funding for the 10 national security sectors. Now that's been combined into the United States Innovation and Competitive Act that passed in the Senate, and I think is being worked on uh, in Congress. And one of the things that we, we said to Senator Schumer is we think that we could get that uh, at that time, 150 billion uh, matched with private sector investment and investment from our close technological uh, technological allies, and get it up to 500 billion. What's your perspective? 
you know, on that. You've been talking about the moonshot. I mean, this is this is big. I mean, this is a big, big bill. Yeah, I'm encouraged. Obviously, it came out of Senate with 69 votes, you know, the 100, you know, good bipartisan support. And, uh, you know, I was personally dialing for dollars with a number of those senators. And we appreciate your, you know, <laughs> Senator Young there as being one of the uh, leaders in getting that uh, done. And uh, now, you know, we think the 52 billion CHIPS Act that currently is sitting in Congress has good bipartisan uh, support. And, you know, I think this uh, idea of, of uh, one third, two thirds is about right, uh, Keith, as you guys conceived it uh, initially, where, you know, about, you know, what we've seen is, is that the Asian industry and, you know, you know, another point to make here, uh, Keith, is that, you know, it wasn't like America or Europe ever said, we don't want that dirty semiconductor industry. What happened was the Asians said, we do want it. And they very aggressively incented this to, to really solidify and expand their supply chain. And, uh, you know, we estimate 30 to 40 percent, you know, cheaper if I was building some of these capabilities in Asia. So, you know, that one third, two thirds is about right uh, to be globally competitive. And we do believe that we're seeing the industry respond. We're seeing uh, Congress respond well. And as soon as some of these other uh, reconciliation matters get forward, you know, move through uh, the House, we're expecting this to come to the top of the heap. I hope it comes into, uh, you know, uh, appropriation approval uh, before the end of the year, because I want to announce our next Greenfield site specifically, you know, as an exclamation point. You pass this, we're launching our next site. But you're so right. You know, I wrote an op-ed uh, in Newsweek about uh, uh, how this this uh, U.S. ICA agreement could be like the Apollo program, right? And really <laughs> be a catalyst. And if you think about that, uh, we're still benefiting from the returns of that. So, uh, well, it's great to get your perspective on it, and and also to get your your support on it. But let me ask you this: There's, you know. In middle America, there's a lot of people hurting these days and, and, and all of that. And what, you've, what you're doing is you're bringing a lot of high paying jobs here to the United States, uh, particularly in middle America. Tell us a little bit about you know, your, your thoughts in terms of how we can do this uh, in other industries like you're doing in the semiconductor uh, industry, Pat. I mean, you're, you're extremely influential in that area. Yeah, and you know, one thing to, to make a point here is even though you know this, these are largely skilled, higher paying uh, uh, jobs, and you know, obviously we want to hire a whole bunch of good boilermakers uh, into them, it also creates an ecosystem. I need a lot of concrete, I need a lot of electricians, I need a lot of plumbers, you know, all of this. And in fact, for every job we create, our studies show that it's somewhere uh, between seven and 10 jobs created. And then, you know, these become ecosystems yeah. that, uh, you know, we need restaurants and right. school teachers and policemen and all that. You know, I'm, I'm building a little city when we start one of these uh, programs. And we do believe that this idea of private public uh, partnership can and should be replicated uh, across additional industries. And we have the wherewithal to do that. Uh, clearly, we've, uh, you know, as we're coming out of the uh, pandemic, you know, we'd love to see that replicated in other areas. We also believe that such foundational investments like semiconductors will spawn other tech areas as well. And as I go and visit my Arizona and Oregon sites, you know, you're driving along and, oh, there's the Google data center and there's the NTT, you know, research location. And there's, the, you know, all of these things just spawn a right. broader set of innovative capacities from those locations. So we think the formula is very replicable, also very scalable. You know, you started, you know, you started working at Intel when you were 18 years old. <laughs> and I mean, let me, this is a fun question. I mean, back then, do you ever think you'd be the CEO of Intel? What's it like and what have you seen? And I know we have a lot of young people in our audience too. Uh, you know, you're a transformational leader, right? And, uh, you know, if, if uh, uh, trust is the most important uh, word in any language, I think change or transformation is, is the most powerful because without that, we don't develop, prosper, and grow. So give us a little bit about your journey. We started at 18 years old and, and yeah. you know, how you became such a great transformational leader. 
Well, you know, and uh, you know, we, uh, uh, I uh, uh, started at 18 uh, at Intel, but the story begins a couple of years before that. I accidentally took a scholarship exam. I won, skipped my last year of high school. So literally I graduated with my associate's degree and my high school diploma, you know, when I was 18. Intel hired me at 18, brought me to California. I finished my bachelor's, master's, PhD work. You know, all while being paid for by uh, Intel. So it was the cheapest, most expensive education. And, uh, you know, uh, I left Intel to go finish my PhD when I was 24. And Andy Grove, you know, the famous uh, Grove uh, founder of Intel, lured me back and said, you can go there to learn on the simulator or stay here and fly the jet. And boy, I was running the 8486 project when I was 24 years old. Just every aspect of this was just a, you know, Cinderella story in so many ways. But I go back even earlier, I'm a farm boy. You know, I was born and raised in the farm country, and I know there uh, in uh, West Lafayette, you're surrounded by cornfields and so on. I'm pretty yeah. comfortable in those cornfields. <laughs> you know, that's, that's where I was raised. In fact, I was just with my dad. Uh, he passed away uh, three weeks ago. Um, uh, Keith, we just had his uh, funeral, one of the most emotional uh, weekends of my life, you know, as I gave the eulogy. You know, for that, he had a first through eighth grade education. You know, he still lives in the schoolhouse that he bought and owns to this day, and that's where mom is living. You know, but a lot of it is just the humility to realize that I, too, am part of the great American story. Right. And my story, nothing but that, which is replicated over and over again, that this is the land of, you know, hard work and opportunity. And uh, now I get to sit here, you know, part of this great icon intel. Right? And I view it as my duty to make this successful for that Grovian heritage that I have, but for the nation's interest as well. And, you know, and I would say to all the leaders here, yeah, strive for success. You know, I, I wrote in the piece of paper when I was 24 years old, I want to be CEO of Intel. You know, and it was like a crazy dream when I wrote it down, Keith. Now it's true. And for that, you just keep working over your career and saying, yeah, you know, I have a crazy dream. And I'm going to work to make it come true. Wow, I love that story. You know, we've we've both been blessed with the good fortune, of being able to live a true uh, Amer all American dream. I didn't know Intel picked up uh, uh, your schooling. I, you know, I got the same thing with General Motors. They paid for my engineering degree and uh, at Purdue, and, and when I went on to get my uh, MBA, they did they did the same thing. And at that time. Uh, my, you know, General Motors was the most powerful, largest company in the world. We had 1.5 million uh, employees. I, I set the goal to be the CEO of General Motors, but I left and went out to Silicon Valley because it looked like you guys were having so much fun out there, man. Uh, and and, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad I did. But, uh, you know, the other key thing, uh, and I'm sure in your career, is mentorship. I mean, because a lot of things aren't written in a book. Tell me about mentors in your life or the role that mentorship has played in your life, Pat. Yeah, and you know, clearly the most influential mentor in my life was Andy Grove. And you know, fun little story, you know, I was uh, working on taping out the 386 and uh, you know, presented to Andy, Gordon, Bob Noyce, and they, uh, you know, and I sort of chewed them out, right? You know, you got to fix these computers or I'm not getting my chip out the door. A few days later, I get a call from Andy Grove, right? And I wasn't expecting, who is it, right? Andy, Andy who? Andy Grove, you know? <laughs> you know? And he said, you know, started to shell me with questions. And he, you know, uh, after him, he said, those are lousy answers. Be in my office in a week with better ones. And if the president tells you to show up in his office in a week, what do you do, Keith? Right? You either show up or leave the country. Right? And that began a mentoring relationship you know, with the famous Andy Grove. And literally, he was a mentor to me until he passed five years ago. And uh, mentoring with Andy Grove was like going to the dentist and not getting Novocaine. He was <laughs> tough. He was hard. But he made me better. Wow. And everybody needs those influence. We're all diamonds in the rough. And we need those people that are knocking off the rough facets so, you know, the full vibrancy of everything God created you to be can shine through. So, yeah, I am such a huge believer in mentorship. And everybody who's listening to this, no matter where you are in your career, you need multiple mentors who are breathing into your life to make you better. Yeah. 
oh, you're so right. And by the way, how about having Andy Grove as, as your mentor? <laughs> you know, what's interesting is if you look at the genealogy in Silicon Valley, it all either goes back to Fairchild or HP. And, you know, I was fortunate. A guy who's been a great mentor in my life is John Chambers, you know, the former CEO of Cisco. And I remember once uh, we had our mentoring session. We had breakfast uh, once a month. And he would go to me, Keith, I, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. I go, John, what am I thinking? <laughs> he goes, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And I go, you're right. I, I'm wondering, why are you doing this? I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate. He goes, well, you see, because when I came out from Boston, when I came out from Wang, I didn't know uh, uh, stuff from Shinola. And see, somebody did it for me. God bless his soul, Lou, pa Lou Platt. And I remember I asked him, why are you doing it for me? And he said, well, because you see, somebody did it for me. And, <clears throat> and so, so the only thing I ask, Keith, is that you pass it on. And that, Keith, is the magic of Silicon Valley. And by the way, we've been, <laughs> we've been able to live that and been benefit. Well, you are a great mentor. You're a transformational leader, Pat. You are a star at Intel. I'll tell you, you're a patriot. Uh, God bless you, and, and thanks for joining us here today. Let's give it up hey, for Pat Gelser. Thank, thank you. So much. Thank you.